Well, I have a message for the church tonight. And it was something that uh, me and the Women Rock, where are my Women Rock AM girls at? Some of you probably are in here, so you're going to get a double dose, okay? Because I was praying, and when they asked me to preach tonight, I asked the Lord, what is it you want me to speak on? And he said, the series you did is for the church body as a whole. And what I need you to do is I need you to get it out there. It needs to be heard because it's the message that is going to break heaven open in our lives. How Does anybody want heaven to break open in your lives? What if I told you that this was a word, that it would pour out of heaven, it would be a blessing upon you? How many of you want to be blessed tonight? Yeah, I want some blessing from God, right? Sometimes we get so much junk from the world, I need a good dose of God's blessing. Well, as I was in prayer, and I was actually studying for the women's ministry and just thinking about different series that we're going through. We're going through the Holy Spirit right now. We just started that last week, and so exciting. My PM girls, we were talking about we are the I can girl. But as the body of Christ, I believe God wants us to talk about unity. So where are the men in this house? Ooh, I love the men. You guys are strong, you lead us, you protect us, and I honor you tonight. So thank you for being men, godly men. Thank you for being men that said yes to God and no to hell, and that you're leading the families and people that you are over. Thank you for going to your jobs every day. Thank you for loving your wives. Thank you for taking care of your children. I just personally want to thank you from a woman to say thank you, because it's not so normal anymore. And sometimes the girls, I'll hear them say, there's just no good men out there. And I'm like, but they are. There are good men out there. The ones that serve God and love the Lord deeply and take care of their homes and their families. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for serving the kingdom of God. And when the men and the women can come together in a room like this, look around. Nobody's the same, right? We all come from different walks of life. We all look different. We all eat type, different types of food. We all like different types of things. You could be married and like totally opposite things, right? Because opposites attract. But God knew that the body of Christ, that humanity, was going to have a whole bunch of different flavors. And I love that about God because God said, I'm going to put you all together. And I'm going to ask you to be yourself in a group but serve me full-heartedly. How do we do that? God says, this is how you do it. You do it unified. You do it together, walking hand in hand, together as one. And so tonight, we're gonna talk about the blessing of unity. We're gonna talk about what God says about unity. And I'm calling this message better together than we are apart. We're better together than we are apart. You know, the world likes to isolate us. I believe that the world that we live in now, you can be on your phone and really feel like you've kind of connected with people. Have you ever felt that way? That you get with them in person, you're like, I really don't want to ask you questions about yourself because I already know that you went on vacation and like what you did and what you ate. And I already know, you know, and so it's like sometimes the mystery is gone. And so we don't, we don't no longer look at each other in each other's eyes and we don't have conversations with each other. We don't pick up a phone anymore. That's like so rude, right? How dare you call me? Good Lord, why are they calling me? And then do you ever like call someone and then you get a text right away? You're like so rude. You saw me calling and now you're texting me. So we could not get each other, right? We can miss it. But yet what can we do together that we won't miss? The word of God. We as Christians... Society is changing, the world is changing, but this does not change. This is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is constant, and he is is strong. He's omniscient. I hate these words. They're omnipotent. Omnipotent. You all could just laugh at me. I'm going to forget it. My mom and me went over this for about 20 minutes the other day, and I'm like, what is my problem? And he is just such a faithful God. And he is so good that he's not going to leave us alone. So as I was studying, the Lord brought this verse to me. And, and it went off in my spirit, man. Have you ever read your Bible and you're like, ooh, that's for me? Yeah. When, that, when that happens, you need to highlight that. You need to underline that. And then you need to study on that all week. And just let the Holy Spirit begin to nurture every word in that verse, okay? So when that happens, don't lose the verse for yourself. Because that's probably a God verse for you. 
And so I felt like while I was reading my word, God gave me these scriptures, and he said, this is for the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Because I believe the World Outreach Center is not just something we tag on, but I believe it's an influence that God is giving us, and it's a place that God wants to bring us. But yet we've got to learn this stuff here first. Let it get anchored into our hearts so that we can spread it to the world and they can know the goodness of God. Psalms 133, you ready? Psalms 133. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Who is brethren? That's like such an old school word, right? Sometimes the Bible just uses these old words, but look around. Person on your right, person on your left, the person behind you and in front of you is your brethren. These are Christians. How good and how pleasant it is. I love when God says, behold, take notice. I'm about to say something that's going to rock your world, that is going to change your life. But sometimes we just read right through and we're like, oh, behold, how good and how, okay, well, that's nice. How good and how pleasant it is. I don't know if we understand the concept as humans, what good and pleasant is. It's a temporary thing. Like I eat chocolate and ooh, that is good. And it is pleasant. And then you gain the weight and you're like, it is not good and it is not pleasant, right? We're so used to things coming and going so fast. Did you know happiness is for a moment, but joy can be even in a tribulation? It's something that's anchored because it's anchored in Christ Jesus. So God is saying, behold, how good and how pleasant it is. What is God's goodness? It is his glory. His glory is pouring out upon us as the body of Christ. And he's saying, behold, my glory is on you. How pleasant I am when brethren dwell together. Did you know heaven right now is at attention going, look at all those people at the rock right now. Amen. They all came together tonight. They got dressed. They didn't want to get out of their cozy homes. They wanted to be lazy, but they said, no, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go stand in church and I'm going to praise God and then I'm going to hear the word and I'm going to be next to people that maybe I don't feel comfortable with, but you know what? They're my brother and they're my sister and I'm going to make time for God. And God says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But that word unity to me is something that is so mind-boggling nowadays. We don't get it. What we think unity is, is like commitment to maybe a political party. Ooh, I won't, don't touch that, Pastor Jess. Don't go there. But what if I did go there? And what if I told you, you aren't part of a political party. You're part of the kingdom of God. What if we, we tribally segregate? We do. Where, oh, well, I'm Mexican, and I'm Italian, and I'm this, and I'm that. Listen, what if I said to you, okay, cool, but you're actually kingdom? You're actually saved and born again under a new kingdom? And that who we are on this earth does not identify our nature any longer. Because our old man died, and we arose again, and we became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Right? So when God is talking about unity, he's talking about us stripping ourselves and stepping into something that he has asked us to do. That means that I don't get the, the comfort of having division in my life with another Christian. What? But what if they're shady? What if they did me wrong? What if, oh, I can't go there. You know, I got to take revenge on them. You got to get rid of that old gangster mindset. You've got to, because God doesn't operate like that. It's not his revenge mode. It, it's not your revenge mode. He's the one that takes vengeance, not yours. And all you have to do is stay silent, walk in love, walk in faith, walk in unity, and God will begin to do something supernatural in your life. He will silence your accusers. He will take care of those that are coming against you, those on your right and those on your left, those in the front of you and behind you. You see, what we do, though, is we take matters into our own hands, and we operate in the flesh, and then we say, we come to church, and we say, we love you, Jesus. Jesus, and oh, I love my brother and my sister, but did you hear what they did last week? I cannot believe it. And the Lord is going, whoa, 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 knock it off. Come on, church. You've got to be better than that. You've got to link together. You've got to hold yourselves together. Verse 2, it is like a precious oil on the head running down the running down onto the beard, the beard of Aaron running down to the edge of his garments. We read that verse, we're like, what is this and who is Aaron? Well, Aaron was the first priest. 
And when God anointed him, the anointing of God flowed all the way down. And he's saying that when we dwell together in unity, that our unity together is anointed by heaven and that it covers us from head to toe. And that when we're in the covering of God and when the anointing of God walks with us because we choose to walk in unity with each other, then guess what happens? We're blessed. We have God's pleasure on us. We see life forevermore. We'll continue on in this. He continues on and says, well, let me give you another example of what I'm talking about. Verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Whew. For there the Lord commands the blessing and life forevermore. So he moved away from the priest, but now he's talking about Zion, and he's talking about the dew that starts at the top. And when I read about this, it was amazing to me, because the, the dew that starts at the top of that mountain actually nurtures everything all the way down the mountain. And there's beautiful fields of flowers, there is beautiful foliage, and there's animals that get fed, and they get drink from the dew that starts at the very top, and it flows all the way to the bottom. Now, God is saying to me in this verse then that when I choose to dwell in unity, that he's going to take care of me, that he's going to provide for me, that he's got me covered. That means he's going to be my one that I can lean on and my rock, my source of strength and my source in time of need. You see, unity unlocks heaven over our lives. And when we choose to step into it, it will be a fight, church. It's not easy, church. It's not something that wants to come naturally to us. We want to be ghetto about what we say. Well, don't you do, mm, ah, here we go. I'm going to take my earrings off and my chunklas. No, we don't need to fight each other on these things. We don't need to go there. You need to hold yourself back. You need to pull yourself together and you need to say, Lord, fight my battle for me. I'm going to choose to walk in love. I'm going to choose to pray for the person that I'm angry at right now. You see, when you choose to take the God side in it, you get the blessing. You get the anointing. You get the favor. You get, the bless you get all of the things that come with heaven. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on what heaven has for me. Our greatest example of unity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Here was God. They're all working together. All different parts of him working together three different ways yet all working together cohesively. One is not vying for the other one or their attention or their job. No, they all know their place in the Godhead. God is not fighting amongst himself. He is not in an argument with himself. One God in three expressions. What if I told you that you are body, soul, and spirit, and that you aren't fighting yourself any longer, but you let your spirit man take over. Do not let your flesh take over. But you let the spirit of God that is living on the inside of you take over and guide you and direct you into unity. You see, God and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking on the Holy Spirit in women's ministry. And it's just mind-boggling to me because Jesus starts out talking about the Holy Spirit and he introduces him and his purpose. And he says, I have to leave, but I'm sending you to one as is if it is me. Woo. So hold on a second. You're telling me that God is doing exactly what I need for every part of my life, giving me every part of what I need. God knew, church, that we would be in this day, at this time, in this world, in these moments, and that we would not need Jesus at this point, but we need the Holy Spirit working inside of us, moving and flowing through us, that when we lay hands on the sick, they will recover, that when we speak with authority, that demons will shudder. You see, God knew, Jesus knew that he had to go to that cross at that time, and that he had to be stripped open as the Lamb of God, but yet they weren't vying for who gets to do that one. I want to go to the cross. Well, no, you're going to be here. They did not fight over these things, but yet God knew exactly what the purpose and the plan was for humanity, and yet if we can see them working beautifully, God working beautifully amongst us in every area of our lives because he's three in one, then we as the church, I think we can work together as well. We might have our differences. We might have our different reasons and purposes in life. But how about this? We began to start choosing to love each other and speaking life over each other. You see, God is a beautiful example. I love what it says. It says that when we are to be one body, one mind, and walk in unity with each other, this is an eternal command from heaven. Did you know that this is a command from heaven? 
I know some of us have a hard time with authority. Maybe we didn't have parents in our lives that taught us right from wrong. Maybe we were allowed to do whatever we wanted, and, and authority is kind of a suggestion. But I'm here to tell you tonight that with God, it's not a suggestion. It's the way to do life. He has set things in place and in order, and the Godhead is commanding things to happen. And when he says it, it is the way it is. And so in 1 Corinthians, go with me to 1 Corinthians 12:13. It says, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. That means no matter what walk of life you come from, we all drink from the same God. We all participate and we all get our strength from the one who is the creator of heaven and earth. If you said yes to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you have the power of God working in you to be one body, one spirit spirit and one mind together, and we've got to work at this church. You see, Paul Billenheimer said this. He says, unity is the one thing that authenticates Christ's divinity, that overcomes the world's unbelief. The world is watching us. The world is seeing, how do they get along? How do they deal with conflict? Do they just cut each other off and move on? How are they speaking to each other? They need to look different than I look in my crazy family. But guys, we can't look the same as the world. We cannot deal with things the same as the world deals with them. Because we have Jesus Christ leading us and how to manage life. So then how do we do this, Pastor Jess? How do I begin to live a life of unity together? How do I do this? Number one, in conclusion and judgment. What does that mean? Well, let's go there. 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, Now I plead with you. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul speaking, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together and in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see, Paul is addressing the church and the people because there's a lot of arguing going on. He's talking to the Corinth church. They are being petty with each other. They are arguing and they're fighting. And he's saying, would you knock it off? You're being a bad witness. You are not looking any different than those around you. Please stop. Would you get yourselves, pull yourselves together. Get yourself in one mind and one spirit. You know, I'm a family unit. I have three kids, husband and wife. And when my family is out of whack, guess what happens? Hey, everybody, get together. Not, come here, come here. What are we doing? Why are we not all operating the way we should? Because this house is not running the way it should. And, you know, as mom, I'm like kind of drill sergeant sometimes. And I'm like, you need to go do this. You need to go do this. And you need, and you need to say sorry to each other. And you see, I feel like that was kind of what Paul was doing to the church. Hey, what are you doing? Knock it off. Get in one mind. Get in one spirit. What are you doing? Come on. And I feel like tonight I'm here to say to you, what are you doing, Rock Church? Let's walk in love with each other. Let's get on one page together. Let's be of one mind together. Let's be of one spirit, the spirit of God together. It doesn't matter what our political party is. It doesn't matter what we think that the president should say or not say. Well, please, let's not even go there. Let's just worry about what the word of God says and then wants to speak over our world. Let's pray for what God wants to be done. Let's pray his will into existence. Let's link arms together, though, whether we're Democrat or whether we're Republican or I guess socialist, but that will just be a whole nother thing for me. But that is where we link arms together and we say, even though you're different than I, I still love you. Yeah. Right? Could you sit next to the person that voted opposite of you and not be irritated and get a fight? Why am I hammering this? Because I watch you on Facebook. Yeah, don't friend me. And I hear your little rants about the different sides. And I see you guys saying mean things to each other on the comments. And you know what it does to me as pastor? What are you doing? You guys are family. Why are you fighting over these foolish people? We're part of a new kingdom. We're part of something greater than this. We, we belong to something supernatural. Why are you biting and devouring? And I feel like Paul was saying this to the body of Christ. He was saying, come on, knock it off. Paul is addressing them and he's saying, we don't look good to the outside believers. Well, guess what? We don't look good to the outside believers when we're arguing and we're fighting and we're biting and we're devouring each other on matters that are not ours to fight. 
See, Paul is addressing the people because they're arguing. We as the body of Christ, we need to get ourselves back into one mind and one spirit. What does that mean? Because I think differently than the person next to me. What does that mean? Because I, I look differently or my lifestyle is different than the one next to me. Guess what? I'm not telling you to be robots. Jesus never asked us to be robots. He knew we would be this beautiful picture of a whole bunch of a different random people with different ways of doing things. And yet he said, but you can come together under me. You come together because you all have the same spirit of God living on the inside of you. Each one of you may have your own place and way of doing things. But yet me, I, Jesus, Holy Spirit lives on the inside of each of you. And so you can come together in one spirit. You can come together in one mind. Because listen, church, you might need to change your mindset tonight. I'm going to challenge you because the the way you were raised and the way you were taught and that's just how your family did it what if I was to challenge you and say not anymore because what does the Bible say about it what does God say that we need to think on these things what is important to the heart of God you see so many times we're running rogue out there and we're biting and devouring each other he's saying church of the most high God you can no longer continue to not be in unity and arguing and biting and devouring each other but you've got to be in one conclusion together you've got to have one judgment alike with each other you may not be the same but you can come together on this on what my word stands for you can come together on this on who my name is and what my purpose is in, in this world you see God God wants us to unite again, church. He wants us to become one spirit, one mind, one judgment. He wants us to do this together because we are stronger together than we are apart. When the body of Christ, we need to get ourselves back into this. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Woo! For what fellowship has righteousness? Right standing with God is righteousness. If you don't know what that is, when you said yes to Jesus, you were put into a position of right standing with Jesus Christ. You are no longer a sinner. You are no longer somebody who is on their way to hell, but you are somebody who has a right standing with Jesus Christ. And he say, what does my son or my daughter, who has a right standing of God, who has the purpose and the destiny of the kingdom inside of them, what are they doing playing games with the world? What are they doing linking arms with the ungodly, lawless things of this world? This is what it's saying. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? We are in a lawless time. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I went to the Nike store just recently. And <coughs> I had just left right before a whole group of people decided that they were going to walk in, take as many Nikes as they could, look up at the cameras and be like, peace, and walk out. And I was seeing this happening online, and I was like, oh, my goodness, like, we were, we were just there today. That's crazy. How come they can do this? And then they showed how they could do it. Because they changed the law in California that if you steal something, you no longer go to jail. There's not a consequence for it. So they can just walk in, take what they want, and walk out, and they're like, peace. And see, we live in a lawless society. We live in a world that's not on our side, guys. We live in a world that wants nothing to do with God or morals or structure or commitment or loyalty or authority. But I'm here to tell you the kingdom operates under all of that. And so when we see this lawless world, we cannot be like them. It is time for us to step out of our flesh and into the spirit. And God is saying, do not have fellowship with this. What communion has light with darkness? We are all living members of the body of Christ, and we have a responsibility in the kingdom. We are to show the goodness and the pleasure of God to this lost and this broken world. You say, but that's your job as a pastor. No, it's not. It is my job to fill you up, to pour so that you can be ready, so that when you go out, you are on mission. You are a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now listen, don't get me wrong. I do my part. When I'm out there, I'm always looking for a room. Like everybody's a mission field to me. I'm like, ooh, what's your story? Oh, really? Like, believe me, my hairdresser, she's going to get saved. Like I am on a mission because I'm not just normal. I am on call. But listen, you are on call. 
And I'm here to tell you tonight that we have to link arms together. We have to stay together because it's going to speak volumes to this world who hates each other, who's biting and devouring, where there's division roaming everywhere. This is why the church is being, is in the same place as God's plan. He is building unity and strength within you and I. Did you know that? That when you come to church, you are building yourself up in strength. You are building yourself up in unity. You are saying, I need to know more about God. I need to build up my spirit man so when I go back out there, I'm not alone and I'm not going to get defeated. When we are together and we are united and when we are tight, the devil cannot come and pick us off one at a time. But when we are together and when we are safely together, then guess what happens? The enemy has no place. He can't get to us because one is going, nope, you don't get to touch my, my friend. Nope, you don't get to touch my sister my brother. Nope, you don't get to do that. So when we get a bad report, guess what? Don't keep it to yourself. Go and tell the prayer teams so that people are praying for you. So you don't have to deal with sickness on your own. When your heart is broken, why hide and isolate? Instead of isolating, open up to somebody who can be trusted. Come meet with a pastor. Come find a friend in a small group and just ask for prayer because you are not called to do life alone. You are not called to do life alone. And God is saying, church, get in one mind. Get in one conclusion. Get in one judgment. I have so much, but I'm going to skip this whole part because I, I want to keep going with this. Paul Billenheimer in the book of Love Covers. If you like reading books, it's an old book. It's called Love Covers by Paul Billenheimer. It's something I read to myself every year, and I'm so grateful I do. And when you read it, it's, it's written about the church biting and devouring each other. Whereas like the Baptists against the, Charis, against the charismatic, those people that speak in tongues, they're crazy. And, da -da, and they were pointing and devouring and beating each other up in the spirit realm. How dumb. And Paul is going, would you knock it off? What are we doing? We're the church of the Christ. We are church of the most high God. These are things that are not going to ruin if we go to heaven or hell. But let's walk in love with each other. These are non-essentials. Let's stay together on the essential things. That Christ died and rose from the dead. And that he is the one way to Jesus Christ and his name is Jesus. You see, let's stay together. Let's not fall apart. Disunity is the most disruptive sin to the church as a whole. To fail to recognize and understand and appreciate and preserve the unity of the body of Christ here on this earth is equivalent to reopening the wounds of our Savior on the cross. What is being said is that the wounding of the church brings him similar pain as the wounding of his fleshly body on that cross. Wow. Take that in for a second. So when I choose to not forgive my brother or my sister... I'm hurting Jesus. Whoa, what? But that's my issue, not his. Yeah, but he's a parent who wants his family to get together. You know, I'm a mom, and when my kids are fighting, it's horrible. It's, it brings chaos in the family. There's not a unity. You know, when, there, when there's just division and there's dissension going on, and when the enemy is working those things. Because listen to me. The other person that you're mad at is not the devil. It's the devil behind what they're doing. So know your opponent. It's not them. It's the enemy working behind them. And so you get into your prayer closet. You get into your supernatural um, war room, and you begin to break those things off of that person and pray for, to have a clarity, to have an openness, to see what God says, and to change that. And I promise you it works. I've done it so many times, and God is so good and been so faithful in that. We have to know our opponent. Do our best to walk in love and unity, church. Do not put yourself in harm's way. When you walk in toxic relationships, you're putting yourself in a, in a harm's way. What's a toxic relationship? When you walk away from a relationship and you feel like, ugh, and you just know, like, that was not healthy. That is probably not God. And you need to step back and you need to go, okay, if they're saved, you pray for them from a distance, but you keep some healthy boundaries. You do not need to keep saying, oh, well, let's, like, hang out all the time or let's do. No, no, no. Take some healthy boundaries. Get yourself spirit filled up. You just pray it out, and you trust that God's going to take care of them. But do not put yourself in a toxic relationship. That was a word for somebody tonight. And listen, if that's your husband or your wife, you need to get some godly advice. You need to go see a pastor and then maybe a Christian counselor. There's so many options out there for you to get some help. 
because a toxic situation will allow yourself, you will not be able to hear from God. When you're in a toxic relationship, you're going to hear what the devil is speaking, and you're not going to be clear enough to hear what God is trying to say to you in the relationship. You see, rightly dividing the word and praying together, that is powerful. When I am having a hard time, I can call up Reverend Teresa and be like, girl, I'm having a day. Like, let's, like, could you pray with me? And we will pray, and I just feel right away, I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like, I'm fine. You know, and so sometimes people will come and talk to me and I'm probably the weird one that they come and talk to because in the middle of them talking to me, I'm almost like, I don't even need to know the whole story. Let's just pray because, and I will stop people. If you've been in a conversation with me, I'll go, let's just pray. Let's just pray right now. And I've had people go, oh, okay, okay. Like one, one day I had somebody just tell me, you pray and fast a lot. Well, you know, I got a lot of things I need to talk to God about. And so get with God because you need to be on the right page. You need to be in one spirit and one mind. And you cannot do that if you aren't in the right headspace, if you're hearing the wrong voices, if wrong people are speaking to you. See, you need supporting and uplifting people in your life. That's why you come to church. You need to be encouraged. And you need to know that what the language of unity is because this right here is unity. This right here is the pleasure of God. Sitting in the house of God, linking arms together. Romans 12, 18 says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Number two, how do I live in unity? Agape love. Some of you go, well, what kind of love is that? I don't know what agape love is. Well, agape love is a charitable love. Let me give you a verse where agape love is working. John 3, 16, do you know it? Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is agape love. It was a charitable love. It was a love that was self-sacrificial for someone else. Did you know that to stay in unity with somebody, God requires us to give this agape love to others? That's a hard thing sometimes. Because sometimes you're like, I don't want to give love to no, mm -mm, they don't deserve my love. But the Holy Spirit is asking us not to love out of our own ability or in our own way, but because we have the greater one living on the inside of us, to walk in agape love in a charitable way and to give of ourselves to keep the peace and to keep the unity of the body of Christ. That's a beautiful thing. Romans 5, 5 says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out onto our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, I love that. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. What a gift that we have God living with us every day, day and night, in and out. So when you're watching those movies, you just remember he's watching them too. When you are in places you shouldn't be going, don't take the Holy Spirit where he doesn't want to go. Like, let's work on doing this well. But the love that you can give because of God. See, that's humongous. Because when I get into my flesh, then there is not much love I can give. But when I step outside of myself and go, you know what, God, teach me to love this person right now, how you love them. There is a new compassion that comes upon me. And I can say hi to the person where before I was like, I don't even want to say hi. I'm good. I will avoid them at all costs. Are you, is anybody else like that? Like you see them walk in the room and you're like, I'm good. Like let's go the other way. But God is saying, don't go the other way. You confront and you walk in love because that's what I'm asking you to do because that's what I would do. And I live on the inside of you. So you can do this. I feel like it's like the Holy Spirit cheering us on on the inside. Come on. Come on. You guys got this. You don't have to walk away from this. You can be bigger and greater in this because I live on the inside of you. John 13, 35 says, but this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, this is something that my mom has taught us in the women's ministry, and I believe it's a beautiful thing when we learn this lesson. It says, this is an unconditional, supernatural love. It's a love that says, they drew a circle to shut me out of their lives, but love and I drew a bigger circle to draw them back into mine. You see, when people reject you, when they put you down, even in the body of Christ, when they speak ill of you, guess what your part is? Your part is to forgive quickly. Your part is to release them and give them back to God and ask God to deal with them. And your part is to love them with a charitable love. What does that look like? Sometimes it looks like maybe you need to buy them lunch 
What? Uh Uh-uh, I ain't spending no money on them. But what if God said, just do it for me? Because when you do it for God, then you're doing it for them. And see, heaven will open up. Remember what the verse we started with? It will open up. You will have the anointing of God in your life. You will have the pleasure of God in your life. You will have the blessing of God in your life. But God is saying, I need you to do the agape love part so you can have all of that. Agape love is when we see others how God does and not how we do. This isn't always easy, but a mature Christian, which we are striving to be, right, church? A mature Christian with great love can pray and ask God to give us what he sees in a person. It brings heaven to it. It breaks Satan's power over every circumstance. And it releases love with, supreme, with the supreme power of the universe. I have a, a poem for you in this. It says, there is no difficulty that enough agape love will not conquer. No disease that enough agape love will not live, uh, will not love and will not heal. The door that enough agape love will not open. No gulf that agape love will not, cannot bridge. No wall that agape love will not throw down for you. No sin that enough agape love will not redeem. You see, agape love takes it all in. God gave all of him so that we could give all of us for others. Let's be united. Number three, you ready? Last one. We can do this thing called unity in one affection and in friendliness. What does that look like? I don't know. So I had to go to the word. What does that look like, God? Because I don't sometimes feel like I'm the friendliest person, right? I'm too busy. I got a lot of things going on in my life. And God says, let me teach you what this looks like. So John and Peter, they were in prison. They were thrown into prison. And they were told, do not speak of this Jesus. Because the Jews did not want his name even spoken. And then so John and Peter, what they could have done is they could have said, okay, we're going to just go our own way. We're not going to, we're going to do what they say. We're in prison. But you know what they said? No way. We are going to tell the church to talk about Jesus. And so they told the church, get the word out. We need you guys to pray. And the church came together. So go with me to Acts 2.40. Acts 2.40. Are you guys still with me tonight? I mean, this is what the church before us did. So we can learn from them because they were under such persecution. They're, they were the first ones getting the gospel so that you and I can sit in this room tonight with the Bible. Isn't that amazing? So let's learn what they had to do. Let's learn what they had to live. Acts 2, 40 through 44, we're going to go there. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And then those who gladly received were baptized. And on that day, 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly, apostles' doctrines, in fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many signs and miracles were done through the apostles. And now all who believed together had all things in common. So when they came together, the power of God moved. When they were told to shut up about Jesus, guess what? It's coming, guys. They're already trying to silence the church. You may not even know that, but I'm dealing with the laws that they change every six months. And let me tell you, it is against the house of God. And we are having to be creative with the Holy Spirit on how to have church in such a broken land, one that hates God. And so when somebody's going to come and say to us, don't say the name of Jesus, what are we going to do? We better get together like they did. We better begin to see the power of God move like they did. We don't stay silent or shut up, but we link together. We pull together. We get into some prayer meetings. We begin to seek the face of God. We begin to see God on a deeper and greater level. When we are together, there is power. And and God begins to move. And signs and miracles are going to happen. We will see revival, church. But we have to be hungry for it. We have to go after it as these people did. And you see, they went on in Acts 4.32. Um, I'm going to read there real quick. And it says, this is also what happened. And now the multitude of those who believed. This is later on now. So all of them got together and began to see signs, miracles, and wonders. All of them got together and said, they told us to be quiet, but we're not going to be quiet. Oh no, we're going to gather together and we're going to start praying. We're going to, we're going to, We're going to command heaven to move on our behalf. And when the church begins to pray, 
When the church begins to say, I'm going to shut my mouth and not argue, but I'm going to pray. I'm going to go to the one who can change something, and I'm going to talk to him. And when we get together, there was power. So now all this time later, this is what they've seen. Because they were faithful in their, in their witness of who they were together, the world was watching around them. This is what happened. This was a result of their unity during that time. Now the multitudes of those who believed were in one heart. And and one soul. Neither did anyone say that another of things he had possessed was his own, but they all had these things in common. And with great power, the apostle gave witness to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, it says that there were multitudes that were saved in the Bible. If you keep reading these stories, I just, for time purposes, I can't. So if you want to go back and read these, you should on your own this week. Because it will fill up your spirit, man. And you'll begin to be like, ooh, come on, we need to do that, church. Because when they came together, people came to God. It was like a drawing to something good and glory and blessing. That world is dark and nasty. So when we shine God's goodness, when we are happy in the midst to brokenness, guess what that says? Well, I want that. I don't want what I'm living right now. What, what do you got that I don't have? And people get saved and lives get changed. And this God of heaven and earth, the God of angel armies comes and moves on our behalf and he backs us. You see, there were one heart, one soul. And in the Greek, this was translated a tune. You're going, what? I want to play with me for a second. Close your eyes and you're in a symphony. What instrument are you? Say it. What instrument? Violin. Violin. Ooh, I like that one. Anybody else want to be a trombone? Yeah, you do? Okay. And every instrument has its own purpose, right? And every instrument sounds its own sound, right? Have you ever been to band practice before they start playing the song? It is a pet peeve of mine. I hate it. I could never be a sound person because they all just play whatever they want, and it's like, is like fingers on a chalkboard. But yet when the conductor stands in front of the orchestra and he taps and they all come together as one, what happens? A beautiful melody. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful moment. Have you ever been to a symphony? You could cry because the music is so beautiful. Guess what body of the Most High God? You and I, when we come together, we are like that beautiful symphony to this nasty world. And we are a beautiful arrangement of what heaven looks like to a very broken world. And that is what God is saying. He's saying, get yourselves in tune and follow me as the conductor. Keep your eyes focused on me, church. I am the one that will lead you and guide you. I am filling you and I am equipping you. I have built you for this time. You have got this, but I need you to stay unified. I need you to stay connected. I needed to be kind to each other. You see, God wants us to go further and farther. He wants us to receive him. Listen, he is coming back, church, and you will either be ready for him or you will not. And God is saying, I'm stirring you up right now. This is a word for the church and the body of Christ. He is coming. Will you be ready? Will you be a sweet melody of his goodness when he comes back? The word of God says, will I find faith on the earth? Woo. Why does Jesus need to even say that? Because there will be a lot of us that fall away because we choose not to walk in love and unity with each other. And God is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Fight against it. Stay in love. Stay in faith. Stay in unity. One soul in the Greek means to breathe. It means to breathe in sync. Woo. Listen, breathe in sync. What does that mean? Me and my brother Luke, you guys know Pastor Luke. Some of you do. We shared a room as little kids. And I remember Luke would always knock out before me. And he had his bed on one side of the room, and I had my bed on the other side of the room. And I remember I would just, there was no noise. And so I would hear Luke breathing, and I would be like, my breath is a lot faster than his. And I remember, like, being worried about it because I'm a little OCD. So I would stop breathing, and I would start breathing with him. And I remember as I would start breathing with him and slow my breath down, I don't remember anything. I would always pass out and go to sleep because Luke was in a pace of sleeping. And so it would put me to rest. 
And we were breathing at a pace together, and we were in sync together, and we were at rest. You see, I believe that when we as a church, we are in the same breath together, when we are working together, that we are in the same pace and the same rhythm with each other, that heaven can begin to use us in ways you've never been used before. You didn't know things were built up on the inside of you. You didn't know that God had something for you, but he needed so-and-so to be in your life because you two together were a dynamic force. You see, you you don't know what God is doing. And when we would allow the heavens to open up and link us together in unity, God is going to unlock some things. Together they are unleashed in the power of the Holy Spirit and in prayer. John 13, 35, by this we all know that we are his disciples if we love one another. So did you get something from God today? How do we start walking in unity. Number one, we come together in conclusion and judgment. Number two, agape love. Number three, affection and friendliness.